Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Are we all excited and ready for another day? Another week? Another podcast? Here at Foggy Bunch at Sunday Brunch Podcast. We're all here to just listen, enjoy, and probably learn something new. And, well, we're continuing with our last topic, which was video game genres and their subgenres. If you remember, we're in the action genre, and so far we've gone over exactly what an action game is, which for a quick, quick recap, an action game emphasizes physical challenge that requires hand-eye coordination and motor skills to overcome. They center around the player who is in control of most of the action. Most of the earliest video games were considered action games. Today, it is still a vast genre covering all games that involve physical challenges. And so the two uh, sub-genres within the action game genre that we have done so far have been platform games, or platformers, which uh, have gameplay primarily centered around jumping and climbing to navigate the player's environment, and shooter games, or just shooters, uh, players use ranged weapons to participate in the action, which takes place at a distance. Most shooters involve violent gameplay. Lethal weaponry is used to damage opponents. However, some shooters, such as Platoon, have non-violent objectives. That is what we have done so far. And this week, we're going to be jumping in and hopefully hitting a couple. So, first up is the fighting game. Subgenre. So... A fighting game is a video game genre based around close combat between a limited number of characters in a stage in which the boundaries are fixed. The characters fight each other until they defeat their opponents or the time expires. The matches typically consist of several rounds (sighs) in an arena with each player character having different abilities but each is relatively viable to choose. I tried to say play and choose so I became plues. Uh, Players must master techniques such as blocking, counterattacking, and chaining attacks together into combos. Starting in the early 1990s, most fighting games allowed the player to execute special moves by performing specific input combinations. The fighting game genre is related to, but distinct from, beat-em-ups, which involve a large number of enemies against the human player. Uh, The first game to feature fist fighting was Heavyweight Champ in 1976. But it was Karate Champ, which popularized one-on-one martial arts games in arcades in 1984. The following year, Yi'ar Kung Fu featured antagonists with different fighting styles, like, well, uh, while The Way of the Exploding Fist further popularized the genre on home systems. In 1987, Street Fighter introduced hidden special attacks. And then in 1991, Capcom's hugely successful Street Fighter II refined and popularized many of the conventions of the game. The fighting game subsequently became the preeminent genre for video for competitive video games in the early to mid 1990s, particularly in arcades. This period spawned dozens of other popular fighting games, including franchises such as Street Fighter. Dead or Alive, Tekken, Mortal Kombat, Super Smash Bros., and Virtua Fighter. It's crazy to me to just think about just, like, how so many of the games I play today are just hugely based upon things that happened, oh my god, 45 years ago. Yeah, wow is right. 1976 was 45 years ago. I was just like, oh, that was only 30 years ago. Wait, it's not 2000 anymore. It's 2021. Jeez. (sighs) Uh, So, definition. Fighting games are a type of action game where two, or sometimes more, on-screen characters fight each other. These games typically feature special moves that are triggered using rapid sequences of carefully timed button presses and joystick movements. 
Uh, I can tell you for a fact that like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat have ridiculous special abilities, both hidden as well as like secret fatalities and brutalities that are based almost entirely off of just an insane series of like uh, left, right, uh, diagonal up, left, diagonal down, right, right, up, down, left, B, A, B, just to execute one move. And you have to do that in like half a second. Ridiculous. Um, games traditionally show fighters from a side view, even as the genre has progressed from 2D to 3D graphics. Street Fighter 2, though, not the first fighting game. <sighs> oh, excuse me. Popularized and standardized the conventions of the genre, and similar games released prior to Street Fighter 2 have since become more explicitly classified as fighting games. Fighting games typically involve hand-to-hand -hand combat, but may also feature melee weapons. The genre is distinct from beat-em-ups, which is another action genre involving combat, including hand-to-hand -hand combat, where the player must fight any weaker enemy, or must fight many weaker enemies at the same time. During the 1980s, publications used the terms fighting game and beat em up interchangeably, along with other terms such as martial arts simulation, or more specific terms such as judo simulator. With hindsight, critics have argued that the two types of games gradually became dichotomous as they evolved, though the two terms may still be conflated. Fighting games are sometimes grouped with games that feature boxing, MMA, or wrestling. Serious boxing games belong more to the sports game genre than in the action game genre, as they aim for a more realistic model of boxing techniques, whereas moves in fighting games tend to be either highly exaggerated or outright fantastical models of Asian martial arts techniques. As such, boxing games, mixed martial arts games, and wrestling games are often described as distinct genres, without comparison to fighting games, and belong more into the sports game genre. So, I've played lots of games like that. For instance, like, I've played Mortal Kombat. I actually own Mortal Kombat 10. I've played much of some of the older Mortal Kombats. I've played the, um... Oh, what's it called? It was in all the arcades. Soul Calibur. But Soul Calibur aims to be ridiculous, if you really think about it. Because Soul Calibur is all about that base. Um, it's just bringing video game characters. So you can have literally, like, Master Yoda. Link from The Legend of Zelda. Like, they've... They, they just pull other franchises together, because they can. So, yeah. Okay, so, game design. Fighting games involve combat between pairs of fighters, usually, usually using highly exaggerated martial arts moves. They typically revolve around primarily brawling or combat sport, though some various feature weaponry. Though some variations feature weaponry. Games usually display on-screen fighters from a side view, and even 3D fighting games play largely with a 2D plane of motion. Games usually confine characters to moving left, right, and jump, although some games such as Fatal Fury, King of Fighters, allows players to move between parallel lanes of motion or movement. Uh, you can also duck, excuse me. Recent games tend to be rendered in three dimensions and allow sidestepping, but otherwise play like those rendered in two dimensions. Uh, tactics and combos. Aside from moving around a restricted space, fighting games limit the player's actions to different offensive and defensive maneuvers. Players must learn which attacks and defenses are effective against each other, often by trial and error. Blocking is a basic technique that allows a player to defend against basic attacks. Some games feature more advanced blocking techniques. For example, Capcom Street Fighter 3 features a move termed parrying which causes the parried attacker to become momentarily incapacitated. A similar state is termed Just Defended and SNK's Garu Mark of the Wolves. SNK. 
I don't know what SNK stands for. SNK is the name of a company. Shin Nihon Kikaku. Neo Geo video game platform? I've never heard of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, counterplay. Pierce, predicting opponents' moves and counterattacking, known as countering, is a common element of gameplay. Fighting games also emphasize the difference between the height of blows, ranging from low to jumping attacks. The strategy becomes important as players attempt to predict each other's moves, similar to rock, paper, scissors, except for with fists and fatalities. Uh, grappling and takedowns. In addition to blows, such as punches and kicks, players can utilize throwing or grappling to circumvent these blocks. Most fighting games give the player the ability to execute a grapple move by pressing two or more buttons together or simply by pressing punch or kick while being extremely close to the opponent. Other games, like Dead or Alive, have a unique button for throws and takedowns. Uh, projectiles. Used primarily in 2D fighting games, projectiles are objects that a fighter can launch at another fighter to attack from a distance. While they can be used to simply inflict damage, Projectiles are most often used to maneuver opponents into disadvantageous positions. Uh, the most notable projection projectile is Ryu and Ken's Hadouken from Street Fighter. Uh, rushdown. The opposite of turtling. Uh, rushdown refers to a number of specific aggressive tactics, philosophies, and play styles across all fighting games. The general goal of a rushdown player is to overwhelm the opponent and force costly mistakes either by using fast, confusing setups or by taking advantage of an impatient opponent as they are forced to play defensive for prolonged periods of time. Rushdown players often favor attacking opponents in the corner or as they get up from a knockdown. Both, situa both situations severely limit the options of the opponent and often allow the attacking player to force high-risk guessing scenarios. Um, spacing and zoning. Zoning is whatever series of tactics a player uses to keep their opponent at a specific distance. What exactly that distance is depends on both who the zoner is and who the opponent is using. Differing based on the tools at their disposal versus the tools that the, opponent, the opposing player has. So, for example, if your, character, if your opponent is a slow, long-distance moving character... Uh, you're just gonna wanna. Uh, keep them at a distance. Or keep them really close. Because they attack from a range, but they're really slow. Uh, turtling. Turtling refers to fighting game tactic of playing very defensively and waiting for the opponent to make a move. It's somewhat of an extreme form of defensive playing. And then there are special attacks. An integral feature of fighting games includes the use of special attacks, also called secret moves, that employ complex combinations of button presses to perform a particular move base beyond basic punching and kicking. Combos, in which several attacks are chained together using punches and kicks, are another common feature in fighting games and have been fundamental to the genre since the release of Street Fighter Do Deuce. Uh, some fighting games display a combo meter uh, that displays the player's progress through a combo. The effectiveness of such moves often relate to the difficulty of execution and the degree of risk. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> These moves are often beyond the ability of a casual gamer and require the player to have both a strong memory <clears throat> and excellent timing. Taunting is another feature of some fighting games, and was introduced originally by SNK in their game Art of Fighting. It is used to add humor to games, but can also have an effect on gameplay such as improving the strength of other attacks. Sometimes a character can even be noted especially for taunting. For example, Dan Hibiki from Street Fighter Alpha. Super Smash Bros. Brawl introduced a new special attack that is exclusive to the series known as a Final Smash. Um, let's see. 
Sure. Uh, matches and rounds. Fighting game matches generally consist of several rounds, which is typically a best of three scenario. So if you win the first two matches, you've won two out of three, which is the best of three. So you win. Uh, the player who wins the set number of rounds wins the match. Each fighter has a different entrance before the match, and once the in-game announcer gives the signal, typically round one, fight, the match officially begins. If the score is tied after an even number of rounds, then the winner will be decided in the final round. Fighting games widely feature life bars, which are depleted as characters sustain blows. Each successful attack will deplete a character's health, and the round continues until a fighter's energy reaches zero. Hence, the main goal is to completely deplete the life bar of one opponent, thus achieving a knockout. Beginning with Mortal Kombat, released in 1992, Mortal Kombat series introduced fatalities, in which the victor kills a knocked out opponent in a gruesome manner. Uh, games such as Virtua Fighter also allow a character to de be defeated by forcing them outside of the fighting arena, awarding a ring out to the winner. The Super Smash Bros. series allows them to send this fly the fighters flying off the stage when a character reaches a high percentage total. Round decisions can also be determined by time over, if a timer is present, which judge players based on remaining vitality to declare a winner. Super Smash Bros. match, if the score is tied between two or more fighters when the time expires, then a sudden death match will decide the winner by giving each fighter 300%. Uh, fighting games often include a single-player campaign or tournament where the player must defeat a sequence of several computer-controlled opponents. Winning the tournament often reveals a special story or an ending cutscene. Uh, and some games also grant access to hidden characters or special features upon victory. Uh, character selection. In most fighting games, players may select from a variety of playable characters who have unique fighting styles and special moves. This became a strong convention for the genre with the release of Street Fighter 2, and these character choices have led to deeper game strategy and replay value. Although fighting games offer female characters, their image tends to be hypersexualized, and they have been featured as pinup girls in game magazines. In many games, they also exhibit exaggerated breast physics. Uh, here's looking at you, dead or alive. <laughs> Cheers. Male characters in fighting games tend to have extra broad chests and shoulders, huge muscles, and prominent jaws. Custom creation, or create a fighter, is a feature of some fighting games which allow players to customize the appearance and moveset of their own character. Super Fighter Pro Wrestling X Premium was the first game to include such a feature. In later fighting games such as Fight Maker, Soul Calibur 3, Mortal Kombat, Armageddon, and Dragon Ball Z Bodoku Tenkaichi 2 adopted this uh, concept. Wow. Closed captioning spelt that all correctly. <laughs> uh, this also applies to the Miis in Super Smash Bros. for uh, the 3DS and Wii U and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate which divided uh, the, the fighter classes into three different styles. The Brawlers, which is good at close range. Gunners, which is good at distance. And Sword Fighters, which is good at sword play. Um, so, there we go. That is the fighting game subgenre. And now we're going to move on to the beat 'em up uh, So the beat 'em up also known as... Brawler is a video game genre featuring hand-to-hand -hand combat between a protagonist and an improbably large number of opponents. Traditional beat-em-ups take place in a scrolling two-dimensional level, though some later games feature more open 3D environments with yet larger numbers of enemies. These games are noted for their simple gameplay, a source of both critical acclaim and uh, derision. Uh, Two-player cooperative gameplay and multiple player characters are also harm hallmarks of the genre. Uh, most of these games take place in urban settings and feature crime fighting and revenge-based plots, though some games sim may employ historical science fiction or fantasy themes. See, the most um, memorable 
brawler beat em up to me is the Simpsons arcade game because I played the crap out of that uh, anytime we went to the Max and Irma's restaurant in my nearby area because they just had they had an upstairs arcade and I could play that for a quarter. I loved playing that game. I could never beat it because I was never good at brawlers, but I enjoyed playing it though. The first beat em up was 1984's Kung Fu Master. <laughs> 1984, uh, with 1986 Renegade introducing the urban settings and underworld revenge themes employed extensively by later games. The genre then saw a period of high popularity between the release of Double Dragon in 1987, which defined the two-player cooperative mode central to classic beat-em-ups, and led to 1991 Street Fighter II, which drew gamers towards one-on-one -on -one fighting games. Games such as Streets of Rage, Final Fight, Golden Axe, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are other classics to emerge from this period. The genre has become less popular since the emergence of 3D-based mass-market games, but still, some beat-em-ups adapted the simple formula to utilize large-scale 3D environments. Uh, in recent years, the genre has seen a resurgence in Asia with the success of South Korean online beat-em-up Dungeon Fighter Online. Uh, so, a beat-em-up is a type of action game where the player character must defeat a large number of enemies in unarmed combat or with melee weapons that are most likely picked up from the ground or earned from power-ups. Gameplay consists of walking through a level one section at a time, defeating a group of enemies before advancing to the next section. A boss fight normally occurs at the end of each level. Arcade versions of these games are often quite difficult to win, which is the purpose because it causes players to spend more money. Beat-em-ups are related to, but distinct from, fighting games, which are based around one-on-one -on -one matches <sighs> rather than scrolling levels and multiple enemies. Such terminology is loosely applied, however, as some commentators prefer to conflate the two terms. At times, both one-on-one -on -one fighting games and scrolling beat-em-ups have influenced each other in terms of graphics and style and can appeal to fans of either genre. Occasionally, a game will feature both kinds of gameplay. In the UK, gaming magazines of the early 1990s such as Mean Machines and Computer and Video Games, C plus VG, referred to all games which had combat motif as beat-em-ups, even the fighting games genres. Uh, however, they were differentiated by a specific prefix. Games like Double Dragon or Final Fight were called scrolling beat-em-ups, and games such as Street Fighter II or Mortal Kombat were referred to as one-on-one -on -one beat em ups So, taking a step back, I can understand why you would want to call games like Mortal Kombat and all that as beat-em-ups, because you are, the entire object of the game is to beat up your opponent. You're supposed to beat them down so that they die. So I can understand why people are just like, but it's a beat em up. Yeah, but it's not. You know? Uh, beat em up games usually employ vigilante crime fighting and revenge plots with the action taking place on city streets, though historical and fantasy themed games also exist. Players must walk from one end of the game world to the other, and thus each game level will usually scroll horizontally. Uh, some later beat-em-ups dispense with 2D-based scrolling levels, instead uh, allowing the players to roam around larger 3D environments, though they retain the same simple gameplay and control systems. Throughout the level, players may acquire weapons that they can use as well as power-ups that replenish the player's health. As players walk through the level, they are, they are stopped by groups of enemies who must be defeated before they are able to continue. The level ends when all the enemies are defeated. Each level contains many identical groups of enemies, making these games notable for their repetition. In beat em up games, players often fight a boss, an enemy much stronger than the other enemies, at the end of each level. Beat em ups often allow the player to choose between a selection of protagonists, each with their own strengths, weaknesses, and sets of moves. Attacks can include rapid combination of basic attacks, or combos, as well as jumping and grappling attacks. Characters often have their own special attacks, 
which leads to different strategies depending on which character the player selects. The control system is usually simple to learn, comprising as little as two buttons. These buttons can be combined to pull off combos such as jumping and grappling attack. Since the release of Double Dragon, many beat-ups have allowed two players to play the game cooperatively, a central aspect to the appeal of these games. Beat-em-ups are more likely to feature cooperative play than other game genres. And that's all we're going to do here, because, um, yeah, uh, I don't really feel like going into the history, because, well, we want to learn about these games, not really, kind of just, like, if there's interesting things, like, the our next series, the stealth series, we are going to go into the history because the actual history of this is interesting to me. The history of the stealth video game is not, or of the uh, brawler is not interesting to me. I just don't think fighting games and brawlers are that interesting. But the stealth game, what influenced them and how it changed over the years is interesting to me. <laughs> So, stealth game. Not to be confused with stealth, the video game. A stealth game is a type of video game in which the player primarily uses stealth to avoid or overcome their antagonists. Games in the genre typically allow the player to remain undetected by hiding, sneaking, or using disguises. There's a hair in my mouth. Uh, some games allow the player to choose between a stealthy approach or directly attacking antagonists, but rewarding the player for greater use of stealth. The genre has employed espionage, counterterrorism, and rogue themes, with protagonists who are special forces, operators, special agents, spies, thieves, ninjas, or assassins. Some games have combined stealth items, elements with other games such as first-person shooters and platformers. Elements of stealth gameplay by way of avoiding confrontation with enemies can be attributed to a diverse range of games, including Pac-Man. Early maze games have been credited with spawning the genre, including Manbiki Shonen, Lupin III, Castle Wolfenstein, 005, and Metal Gear. The genre became a mainstream success in 1998 with Tenchu Stealth Assassin, Metal Gear Solid, Thief, the Dark Project, and later releases like Hitman and Splinter Cell. Unlike most action games, stealth games challenge the player to avoid alerting enemies altogether. The core gameplay elements of the modern stealth game are to avoid combat, minimize making noise, and striking enemies from the shadows or behind. Completing objectives without being detected by an enemy, sometimes referred to as ghosting, is a common approach to stealth games. Avoiding detection may be the only way to successfully complete a game, but there are usually multiple ways to achieve a goal with different pathways or styles of play. That's kind of why I enjoy stealth games a lot, because while you may have one objective, the way to get that objective is almost invariably, like, hidden, changed, like, it's a surprise. Like, it's not going to be the exact same way to do it every single time. Like, you can... Oh, you can take the right path, which has shadows and everything. Or you could take the left path, which involves a lot platforming or other things. Um, sometimes you could even, you know, um, just take the straightforward approach and just climb a wall and jump to it. You know, there's just many different ways to do it, and that's why I love it. Um, players can hide behind objects or in shadows and can strike or run past an enemy when the enemy is facing the other way. If the player attracts the attention of enemies, they may be able to hide or wait until the enemies abandon their search. Thus, planning becomes important as does trial and error. Some stealth games put more emphasis on physical combat when the player is spotted. <laughs> uh, some games offer a choice between killing or merely knocking out an opponent. When ghosting is optional, or, well, not, 
or not well supported by a game, players may still attempt to avoid combat for moral reasons or as a demonstration of skill. Early in the development of stealth genre, these games were referred to as sneak em up games. So, uh, <laughs> that's what I really enjoy about stealth games. Like, uh, with our Deus Ex gameplay, you know, we went for the um, Deus Ex and Dishonored. We went from the whole idea of uh, no killing and no uh, detection. So the ghost and non-lethal paths, which is the mucho, mucho, mucho more difficult paths, but in my mind, more rewarding. So uh, game design for stealth games. When hiding in the dark... Uh, is a gameplay element, light and shadow becomes an important part of the level design. Usually the player is able to disable a certain light source. Uh, stealth games also emphasize the audio design when players must be able to hear the subtle sound effects that may alert enemies to their actions. Noise will often vary as the player walks on different surfaces, such as wood or metal. Players who move recklessly will make more noise and attract more attention. In order for a game to include stealth gameplay, the knowledge of the artificial intelligence must be restricted to make it ignorant of parts of the game world. The AI in stealth games take into specific consideration the enemy's reaction to the effects of the player's action, such as turning off lights, as opposed to merely reacting to the player directly. Enemies typically have a line of sight, which the player can avoid by hiding behind objects, staying in the shadows, or moving while the enemy is facing another direction. Enemies can also typically detect when the player touches them or moves within a small fixed distance. Overall, stealth games vary in what player actions the AI will perceive and react to, with more recent games offering a wider range of enemy reactions. Often, the AI's movements are predictable and regular, allowing the player to devise a strategy to overcome his adversaries. Players are often given a limited are often given limited methods of engaging opponents directly in stealth games, either by restricting the player to ineffective or non-lethal weapons, equipping adversaries with far superior equipment and numbers, or providing the player with a limited amount of health that makes combat scenarios extremely dangerous. Stealth games sometimes overlap with survival horror genre, in which players are forced to hide from and evade supernatural or occasionally mundane enemies as they attempt to track down the player. Like, for example, for, like, the artificial intelligence being restricted to be ignorant, like, if you've got two guys who walk and meet in the middle constantly, uh, and you take out one of them, the other AI is not gonna suddenly be like, oh my god, my partner's gone. There must be somebody around. I better be on high alert. He's just like, oh, I guess he's, uh, going to take a pee. <laughs> So, yeah. All right, now let's look at the history of the stealth game. So, the early developments of the stealth game, 1979 to 1997. According to retro gamers John Szypaniak, how the hell do you say that name? S-Z-C-Z-E-P-A-N-I-A-K. How do you say that name? Uh, the first stealth game was Many Beaky Shonen, or Shoplifting Boy, which was published in November of 1979. The Pet 2001 personal computer game was developed by Hirosh Hiroshi Suzuki. It involves a boy entering a convenience store and attempting to stoplift by stealing dollar symbols while avoiding the line of sight detection of the owner. If caught, the player is led away by the police. Suzuki presented the game to developer Taito, which used it as inspiration for their similar arcade game, Loop in the Third, based on manga and anime of the same name. Uh, released in April of 1980. In November of 1980, Suzuki developed a sequel, Mabiki Soji, Shoujo, which is Shoplifting Girl. Castle Wolfenstein, originally available in 1981, employed stealth elements as a focus of the gameplay. Players were charged with 
while, with traversing the levels of Castle Wolfenstein, stealing secret plans, and escaping. Players could acquire uniforms to disguise themselves and walk by guards undetected. Beyond Castle Wolfenstein, released in 1984, included some additions to its predecessor, such as a dagger for close-range kills and a greater emphasis on disguising in enemy uniforms. Id Software's updated 1992 remake Wolfenstein 3D was originally going to feature some of the original stealth gameplay, such as body hiding, but this was cut to make the game faster paced. As a result of these changes, Wolfenstein would instead pave the way for later 3D action games, specifically the first person shooter. In 1981, Sega released an arcade game called 005 where the player's mission is to take a briefcase of secret documents to a waiting helicopter while avoiding enemy flashlight and using boxes as hiding spots. 005 holds the Guinness World Record for being the first stealth game. Uh, in 1985, Durrell Software released Saboteur, a game in which the player controls a ninja who has to infiltrate a facility and find a disc while avoiding or defeating security cameras, guards, and dogs. Retro Gamer has called this the original stealth game. Mindscape's Infiltrator, released in 1986, combined a flight simulator with stealth-based ground mission. In this ground mission, the protagonist attempts to sneak into enemy territory using false IDs to avoid detection and knock out gas to incapacitate enemies. The goal of this mission is to, take, is to photograph secret documents while avoiding alarms. Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear, released in 1987 for the MSX2 and the NES in 1988, uh, utilized stealth elements with an action-adventure framework and was the first mainstream stealth game to be released on console. Since the MSX2 was not available in North America, only the NES version was released there. Metal Gear placed a greater emphasis on stealth than other games of its time, with a player controlling Solid Snake beginning without any weapons, requiring him to avoid confrontation until weapons are found, and having limited ammunition for each weapon. Enemies are able to see Snake from a distance using a line-of-sight mechanic and hear gunshots from non-silenced weapons. Security cameras and sensors are placed at various locations, and a security alarm sounds whenever Snake is spotted and causes all enemies on screen to chase him. Snake could also disguise himself in enemy uniform or a cardboard box and use his fists to fight enemies. The sequel, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, was released in 1990 for the MSX2, further evolved the stealthy uh, gameplay of its predecessor, and introduced most of the gameplay elements present in Metal Gear Solid, including the 3D element of height, allowing players to crouch and crawl into hiding spaces and hair ducts and underneath desks, the player could also distract guards by knocking on surfaces and use a radar to plan ahead. The enemies have improved AI, including a 45-degree field of vision, turning their heads left and, r left and right to see diagonally, the detection of various sound noises being able to move from screen to screen, they were limited to a single screen in earlier games, and a three-phase security alarms, where reinforcements are called in to chase the intruder, then remain on the lookout for some time after losing sight of the intruder, and then leaving the area. The game also had a complex storyline and improved graphics. So then, between 1998 and 2002, uh, this is where the stealth game was established itself as a genre. So, although stealth gameplay had appeared in previous games, 1998 is seen as a turning point in gaming history because of the release of Tenchu, Stealth Assassins, Metal Gear Solid, and Thief, The Dark Project. The ninja-themed Tenchu, Stealth Assassins, was the first 3D stealth-based game. Months later, the highly anticipated Metal Gear Solid transformed its modestly successful franchise into a mainstream success. The increased power of the PlayStation console over previous platforms allowed for greater immersion in terms of both story and game environment. Metal Gear Solid has been credited with popularizing <sighs> the stealth genre. Thief, the Dark Project, is also credited as a pioneer of the genre. It was the first stealth game using the first-person perspective, dubbed a first-person sneaker or sneak-em-up and the first to use darkness and shadow as the mode of concealment. Another of Thieves' most noteworthy contrib contributions to the genre was the use of sound as a central mechanic. The robust simulation of sound meant players had to be mindful of the sounds they made, including what kind of surfaces they were traversing lest they draw attention to them. 
Conversely, it meant guards can be heard from a distance, and the surfaces they moved on could be identified based on the sounds they made. Side note, I really want to play Thief on stream at some point soon. I've attempted to play it like half a dozen times, and it just never works out. I really want to play it and beat it. So, uh, with further releases, many games in the genre drifted towards action by following the option of direct confrontation. Uh, the Hitman series, the first installment which was released in 2000, allowed this play style, but rewarded player for stealthy and elaborate assassinations of antagonists. Hitman, codename 47, was the first of the series using was the first 3D game to employ the genre's device of disguises. Uh, no One Lives Forever, an espionage-themed parody, also released in 2000, again allowed the player to combine or choose between stealth and overt violence. In 2000, the first-person action role-playing game, Deus Ex, also allowed the player the choice of taking a stealth approach. A USA Today reviewer found... At the easiest difficulty setting, your player pureed again and again by an onslaught of humans and robotic terrorists until you learn the value of stealth. Um, no. Deus Ex, well, okay, Deus Ex, the original Deus Ex, yeah, you would get pureed. Eh, but that's because the game was pretty bad. I really wish we could have played that, but no... It was way, the contrast was so dark, and I couldn't fix it. Anyway, Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, released 2001 for the PlayStation 2, further evolved the stealth gameplay series. It featured an array of new abilities, including leaping over and hanging off of railings, opening and hiding in storage lockers, and sneaking up behind enemies to hold them at gunpoint for items and ammunition. Metal Gear Solid 2 holds a Guinness World Record for being the first stealth game to feature collective artificial intelligence. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty sold 7 million unit in sales, followed by Metal Gear Solid with 6 million units. So then, later developments, which is 2002 to present, which I don't know when this was written. So... Uh, after the mainstream success of the genre, stealth elements became increasingly incorporated into a wide range of video games, with numerous action games using stealth elements in some way or another. In 2002, the first installment of the Tom Clancy-licensed Splinter Cell series was released, which attempted to add more realism to the stealth genre both in terms of graphics and in-game equipment. If the player is discovered in a splinter cell, the guards will often raise a general alarm, which can cause a difficulty spike, or even result in automatic mission failure. Clint Hawking, who worked as a level designer for Splinter Cell, noted that this mechanic was in place at this point because the gameplay developers could not easily implement alternative player actions in the case of such detection. For example, on detection, a real agent may react by sub a yeah, by subduing the agent that found them. But this was not possible to program in at this point of time. Hawking recognized that this would be frustrating to the player and would remain an issue with stealth games for about a decade. In addition, Splinter Cell was notable for its state-of-the-art graphics, including dynamic lighting and shadows. Like Thief, Splinter Cell featured a visibility meter which determined how much light was falling on the character. These effects not only contributed to the atmosphere of the game, but dynamically affected in which areas the player could hide. 2004 sequel Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow added a multiplayer component to the stealth genre. As the genre developed and progressed, stealth gameplay was combined with other games. Sly Cooper, a cell-shaded game released in 2002 with a stealth platformer, while 2003's Siren combined the survival horror with the stealth genre. In the same year, Manhunt employed a snuff movie theme and allowed the player to kill antagonists with varying levels of violence, depending depended on how much time was spent sneaking behind them. It was the first to show ex visual executions in the genre. The following year, Konami's Metal Gear Acid combined the stealth gameplay of the Metal Gear series with turn-based strategy and tactical role-playing elements, as well as card battle elements from Konami's own Yu-Gi-Oh! games. Uh, in 2004, Metal Gear Solid 3, uh, um, 
I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> ah, in 2004, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater introduced camouflage to the game. Set in a jungle, the game emphasized infiltration in a natural environment, along with survival aspects such as food capture, healing, and close quarter combat. The following year, the updated version Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence added an online multiplayer mode to the game with stealth elements. 2004, uh, the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, based on the Chronicles of Riddick series of movies. Uh, the game follows the character of Riddick as he attempts to escape from prison. I think I have a Riddick game, actually. Do I? I think I do. Hold on. Uh, I do have a Chronicles of Riddick. Whoops. Sorry. I've never played it. Um, let's see. The game follows the character of Riddick as he attempts to escape from prison. Action and stealth gaming are combined seamlessly by allowing the character to hide, sneak, or fight his way past most situations. Uh, the game was critically acclaimed and was followed with the Chronicles of Riddick Assault on Dark Athena. Which Chronicles of Riddick do I have? I have... Assault on Dark Athena. Uh, in 2007, Assassin's Creed employed a social element to the so stealth game, where the player is able to hide among crowds of citizens by taking care to blend in. Stealth elements were incorporated into Crytek's open-world first-person shooter Crisis, multiplayer first-person shooter TF2, and first-person role-playing game Fallout 3. 2008, Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of Patriots introduced a battle zone element where the stealth gameplay is incorporated into a battlefield fought between two armies, both of which can be infiltrated by Solid Snake. 2009, Assassin's Creed 2 broadened its predecessor's elements of stealth by allowing the player to blend among any group of civilians rather than specific ones. Assassin's Creed 2 also allowed the player to distract guards by tossing coins or by hiring thieves or courtesans, and also featured a notoriety level, which made the player more recognizable until they paid off officials or tore down wanted posters. The same year, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves and Batman Arkham Asylum incorporated stealth elements in different segments of the games. The multiplayer modes of Aliens vs. Predator in 2010 and Killzone 3 in 2011 also incorporated stealth elements. The 2012 game... Dishonored tried to incorporate stealth elements that were influenced by thieves, such as the importance of lighting and shadow. The developers later abandoned that system, citing realism as a factor. The game instead relies on a system of occlusion-based stealth, using the vision cones of enemies, obstacles, and special abilities which determine whether the character is invisible. Hold on a second. The developers abandoned the idea of using lighting and shadows because... It wasn't realistic. And because they decided that that wasn't realistic, they decided to go super unrealistic with a collision based stealth. Are you freaking kidding me? If you can't make it work, just say you couldn't make it work. Don't make up bullshit like, oh, it's not realistic, so we're going to go with our magic system. Additionally, while other games have implemented such systems, uh, Dishonored was recognized for having a forgiving stealth system compared with Splinter Cell, in that if detected, the player had several options available to either attack those enemies that had detected them, distract them, or flee and outrun them by using parkour, rather than immediately reaching a game over. Forbes called Dishonored one of the best stealth games of 2012, along with Hitman, Absolution, and Mark of the Ninja. I did say I want to play Hitman soon, right? Good. Mark of the Ninja puts a twist to the stealth genre in that it is a <coughs> 2D side-scroller. <clears throat> this posed some unique factors, such as a lack of corners for the character to hide behind and the visibility presented in a side-scroller. The developers overcame this by adding a fog that prevents the player from seeing things that the player can see. Uh, that prevents the player from seeing things that the character can see, visually representing enemy line of sights and then even visualizing the noise made by characters, including how far that noise travels. After the completion of the game, 
The player has access to a harder difficulty called New Game Plus, which further decreases visibility by adding fog behind the player and removes noise visualizations and enemy line of sight indicators. In 2014, Creative Assembly released Alien Isolation, a stealth game which emphasized the survival horror. In this game, the protagonist is trapped on a space station with an alien xenomorph, which they must avoid for the majority of the game, being unable to kill it. The game also uses feedback from the player's microphone to enhance gameplay, as the alien is able to hear noises made by the player and use them to detect their location. Uh, that's only if you use the Connect version of the game. I don't think that's in any other version of the game. If it is, that's amazing, and we should redo that, but... <laughs> in 2019, Untitled Goose Game by Australian developer House House utilized stealth as a major fact mechanic alongside the otherwise comedic tone of the game, leading to comparisons to Metal Gear Solid. Oh, yes, you know that Goose Game that's similar to Metal Gear Solid? I like that game. <laughs> uh, let's see speaking of stealth games I kind of really want to replay another game Aragami is that a stealth game I'd call it a stealth game I think you'd really like this the, uh, Aragami I really want to play it and beat it you don't know Aragami uh, okay. Give me one seco. Uh, I'll send it to you afterwards. All right, let's do one last thing. The survival game. Let's see if I can't crank this out in 10 minutes. <clears throat> survival games are a subgenre of action video games set in hostile, intense, open-world environments. Players generally begin with minimal equipment and are required to survive as long as possible by crafting tools, weapons, shelters, and collecting resources. Many survival games are based on randomly or procedurally generated persistent environments. More recently, survival games are often playable online, allowing players to interact in a single world. Survival games are generally open-ended with no set goals and often closely related to the survival horror genre, where the player must survive within a supernatural setting such as a zombie apocalypse. So, survival games are considered an extension of a common video game theme where the player character is stranded or separated from others and must work alone to survive and complete a goal. Survival games focus on survival parts of these games while encouraging exploration of an open world. They are primarily action games, though some gameplay elements present in the action-adventure genre, such as resource management and item crafting, are commonly found in survival games and are central elements in titles like Survival Kits. At the start of a typical survival game, the player is placed alone in the game's world with few resources. It is not uncommon for players to spend the majority or entirety of that game without encountering a friendly NPC. Since NPCs are typically hostile to the player, the emphasis is placed on avoidance rather than confrontation. In some games, however, combat is unavoidable and provides the player with valuable resources, food, weapons, and armor. In some titles, the world is generated randomly so that players must actively search for food and weapons, often provided with uh, visual and auditory cues of the types of resources that may be found nearby. The player character typically has a health bar, which will take damage from falling, starving, drowning, contact with fire or harmful substances, and attacks by monsters that inhabit the world. Other matrix, uh, metrics may also come into play. The survival title Don't Starve, for example, features a separate hunger gauge and a sanity meter which will cause the death of the character if allowed to deplete. Character death may not be the end of the game, however, the player may be able to respawn and return to the game location at which the character died in order to retrieve lost equipment. Uh, other survival games use permadeath. The character has one life, and dying requires that the game be restarted. While many survival games are aimed at constantly putting the player at risk from hostile creatures or the environment, Others may downplay the amount of danger the player faces and instead encourage more open-world gameplay, where player characters' deaths can still occur if the player is not careful or properly equipped. Player experience. Uh, survival games are almost always playable as a single-player game, but many are designed to be played in multiplayer, with game server hosting the persistent world the players can connect to. The open-ended nature of these games encourages players to work together to survive against the elements and other threats that the game may pose. When there are no opposing players within the same world, this dynamic is often referred to a 
PVE, or Player versus Environment. Whereas when opposing players are present in the same world, this is known as PvP, or Player versus Player. This generally is the players forming alliances, constructing fortified structure, and working together to protect themselves from both the dangers presented by the game's world and other players' characters. Uh, crafting. Many survival games feature crafting. By combining two or more resources, the player can create a new object, which can be used for further crafting. Other games can use just one resource to create another, like Subnautica. This enables gameplay where the player collects resources to craft new tools, which in turn allows them to obtain better resources, which then again can be used to obtain better tools and weapons. A common example is the creation of pickaxes of various levels of hardness. Wooden pickaxes may allow stone to be mined, but not metallic ores. However, a pickaxe made from collected stones can be used to mine those metallic ores. Same concept used to uh, apply to weapons and armors, which with better defense and offense bonuses provided by items made from materials which are more difficult to acquire. Crafting system often includes durability factors for tools and weapons, causing the tool to break for after a certain amount of usage. Crafting systems may not give the player the necessary recipes for crafting, requiring them to be learned through experimentation or game guides. Objectives. There is rarely a winning condition for survival games. The challenge is just to last as long as possible, though some games set a goal for survival time. As such, there is rarely any significant story in these games beyond establishing the reason why the player character has found themselves in the survival situation. Some survival games provide quests, which help the player learn the game's mechanics and lead them to more dangerous areas oh, where better resources can be found. Because of the open-world nature and crafting systems, some games allow for user-made structures to be built. Minecraft, for example, allows players to place blocks to construct rude structures, sorry, crude structures for protection. Yeah, a rude structure. It just looks like, you know, double middle fingers. This is my rude structure. Um... Uh, but as they gather more resources and readily uh, survive, players can create massive structures from the building's uh, building blocks, often modeling real-world and fictional buildings. Survival games typically feature non-replenishing resources, though the player can take steps to allow new resources to generate. For example, in Terraria, chopping down a tree will eliminate that tree, but the player can replant seeds, allowing new trees to grow. Many survival games are presented in the first person's perspective to help immerse the player in the game. Other titles use other methods for a presentation. Games like Terraria and Starbound presented 2D side view, while Storm Starve uses sprites rendered in 3D isometric projection. Furthermore, while survival games are considered action games, there are other genres that feature the survival theme, such as uh, turn-based role-playing game Dead State and Neo Scavenger, and the story-driven first-person series Stalker. Uh, survival mechanics, particularly the resource gathering, hunting, and crafting aspects, have also been incorporated into games in other genres, such as the 2013 Tomb Raider and the Far Cry series. Both are series that I want to play. Uh, quick history. An early example of a survival game is Unreal World, which was created by Sammy Marinen in 1992 and is still in active development. The roguelike game used ASCII graphics and placed the player in the harsh conditions of Finland during the Iron Age. Unlike traditional roguelike games where there was a goal to reach Unreal World's only goal was to survive as long as possible against wild creatures and the dangers that the snowy weather created. Another early example of the survival game genre is the Super Nintendo, the SNES game SOS, released by Human Entertainment in 1993. Worm Online, W-U-R-M, elements have ultimately influenced a number of survival games. Being a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, the game sets players as characters in a medieval setting, allowing them to terraform the world, create buildings, and effectively develop their own kingdoms. Rolf Jansen and Marcus Persson began the initial development of the game in 2003, and although Persson left around 2007, the game is still in active development. Person became instrumental in developing Minecraft, which many consider to have popularized the survival game genre. From its initial release in 2009, Minecraft focuses on resource gathering and crafting in a procedurally generated world and requires the player to defend themselves during night cycles while gathering resources at the same time. Another key title in the survival genre was DayZ, 
It was originally released as a mod for Arma 2 in 2012, but was later released as a standalone game. Uh, the game sets the players in the aftermath of a zombie apocalypse where they must avoid hordes of zombies while scavenging through the remains of human civilization for resources. As a result of the financial success of Minecraft and DayZ, numerous titles of the survival genre were released from 2012 onward. Some believe that the market um, has become saturated with titles based on the same post-apocalyptic setting. Clones of, po of more popular titles and titles released as a quick attempt to make money from using earlier early access models. The research firm Superdata estimated that survival games have brought in over $400 million in revenue over the first six months of 2017, making this genre one of the largest markets in the video game industry. Ooh, doggy. We're almost done with the action genre. We've got two more genres, and then we're done with action. And then we move on to action-adventure. <laughs> yeah, we've almost finished our first of 11 genres. <laughs> so, yeah. Look forward to that next week. Because we've got even more to do. So, I hope you all have been enjoying this uh, dive in and just kind of like skim of these different subgenres and genres. It's really making you think just, man, maybe I do play the same kinds of games and only the same kinds of games. It's funny because I kind of do. All of my games kind of fit into just a set number of things. But anyway, yeah, that's the podcast for today. I hope you all enjoyed, and uh, until the next time, everybody, stay funky, people.